Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burrus. And today we are guestless. Instead – Guest list? Guestless. <laughs> Guest list, yes. Uh, less. Um, so to, on today's episode, what we're going to do instead is talk with my co-host Trevor Burris a bit because Trevor, like many of us, is working on a book. <laughs> um, and the book is based on a lecture that he's given a few times at least. Many times. Uh, probably 50 at this point or something like that. In many countries too. It's a good, it's a good lecture. Um, and so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the subject of the lecture. We're going to talk about the subject of the upcoming book, uh, which he calls the Statrix. You got to always got to come up with a name for something, and then you can own it. So your lecture begins, as so many do, with griping about your experience <laughs> on the metro, um, the the public transportation system here in Washington D.C. Yeah, it's actually how I came up with the lecture because when I was a poor intern, and a big part of the lecture is how this thing I call the Statrix affects poor people. But when I was a poor intern, I was waiting for the metro one Sunday morning and I didn't have enough money really to actually take a cab. And that morning, the metro was what's called single tracking. It's a dreaded thing that happens in DC. And I'm sitting there and what should have been a 20-minute trip turned into a three-hour trip, which happens a lot if you take the metro on the weekends in Washington, D.C. And as I was sitting there, I was saying how great it is that the government designed this thing for me as a poor person, implemented it with taxation and then reorganized the world around this thing and crowded out other alternatives uh, that, to compete against it. And then after they did that, they collude to make sure it doesn't go away. And then after you're stuck in the thing, they fail to run it inadequately. And on top of that, they start prohibiting things like Uber or trying to prohibit Uber or prohibiting things like jitney cab services that could help people get out of the system that has been created around them. And I realized that right there, those were like the seven steps of the government ruining your, ruining your life. So an, alter, an alternate uh, title of this could be the process of government, but that's a pretty boring one. And interestingly, now that the DC Metro is um, – On fire. On fire. Yeah, I mean just go to is the metro on fire com and it can tell you whether or not it is. And we're going through some crazy – uh, track work over the next year for people who are in D.C. You already know I'm sure this is going to happen. And I ended up being a prophet because I said I had said many times that this this metro is going to crash and burn. I thought it was going to have a huge crash, which would create the problems because the D.C. metro, which just underscores my point. Well, it did have a huge crash. It, I mean, yeah. A month after I started at Cato, um, trains collided and killed. Yeah, like it killed like a couple people and hurt a bunch. Um, but but I was expecting something even bigger that would make people shut it down because it it is built with two tracks. Uh, it's the largest metro for five million or whatever people in DC area it has two tracks that run, and so that means and things about metro. As soon as you build one, they start falling apart because of water tables and pressures from the earth. So you have to run constant maintenance. And so when they run maintenance of the DC metro, they have to do it like you do. Maintenance on a street where a guy holds a stop sign, no whole line of cars backs up, and then they let it through. That's what single tracking is, and because that's so disruptive, they've they've actually not done maintenance at the level that they should have for a very long time. Which goes to point step six of the of the process, which is an inadequacy. Okay, well, let me just before we go through the the steps um, of how the government ruins your life, I the metro seems like an interesting example to. Use because your argument broadly is that government takes over something or offers a solution and then excludes other solutions and then the government solution gets worse and worse for a whole bunch of reasons and it continues to prop itself up and forces to use it and bad things happen. But <clears throat> the metro is a is potentially not an example of that because this seems like the kind of thing that's on its face is something maybe only the government could do because yeah i mean uber can put cars on the streets but but cars are not the same thing as subway trains that require digging enormous tunnels under a major city which is probably not something that i mean i know that startup founders are pretty keen on their own abilities but bootstrapping a major subway system is probably out of the reach of, of most small companies and even big ones. So we would potentially need the government and it's not, it's not immediately clear how you would compete with Metro because you can't dig – 
even if the government allowed it, again, it would be a problem to try to dig competing tunnels and so on and so forth. So is it, is it really the kind of thing that we can talk about easily within this framework in the first place? Yeah, it is absolutely the, the, the kind of thing because in order to do a proper critique and understanding of the nature of government and of the alternative that we're trying to propose as a, a freer system, uh, you have to be able to have a deep understanding of how the government, whatever program it is, not every program, but but so many of the programs change how the world looks in a fundamental way. Now, first of all, so first of all, you have to if you're to say what is the metro needed, and you in the this comes up in New York, for example, which is the closest metro to breaking even because uh, the metro is heavily subsidized here too. So people aren't paying the full price for it and actually trying to come up with what are the costs of having this metro. Well, some of it is sprawl and things like this. People have reorganized their life around the metro. So if someone asks, if someone asks the question – and this sort of just highlights my basic point when we get into things that are not transportation things. But someone says, well, if the New York subway didn't exist, how would people from South Brooklyn get to Manhattan to work? And the answer to that question is New York City would look fundamentally different than it does now. And there are many ways that people decide where to live based on the availability of transportation options. And what's actually competing against the metro are Ubers and jitney cabs and other things that could exist – that the human imagination can come up with or people just not actually living someplace because there's nowhere to get into the downtown or having two different city centers where there could be different commuters going as opposed to one different city center in Denver. They have the tech center, which is south before they put in their light rail system. So you have to look at it in a much more complex way to figure out how this government thumb on the scale is the way I describe it. Sometimes it's just a thumb on the scale. Sometimes it's a massive transportation project, how it has changed how the world looks. And that's why I call this thing the Statrix. So is the Statrix a riff on the Matrix yes. or on Dominatrix? <laughs> I like that second one. We could come up with some sort. No, it's a, it's a riff on the Matrix, a combination of the state and Matrix. And that's sort of what I tried to do with these six – with these seven steps, which is to give the blue pill or the red pill. Sorry, it's the red pill that gets you out of the Matrix, right, when he offers the two pills to Neo and try and get people to see – how the government has created a world around you that's almost a virtual virtual reality world, and so my my hope is after you read my book or listen to this podcast or hear me speak that you have a better you're more like Neo at the end of the Matrix where he can suddenly see the code around him. All those times you're like, why is this this way? There's so many things in the world that we just accept as being normal, but they are fundamentally not normal. They are a virtual reality experiment that we live in that I call the Statrix. So what's step one? So step one is just the basic con conceptual step. And I said this is a rubric to put many things into that the metro is, is a particularly useful one. But the question is, is what is the thing being built for? Because the, the big part of this is the people who are most trapped in the statrix are poor people generally speaking. And so many of these things that are conceptualized as help to the poor end up being – things that the poor people are actually trapped in. It's rich people who can get out of these things, which is why the kind of social justice, the egalitarianism that's part of libertarianism, I think rightly conceived, needs to make this critique especially about poor people. It's poor people who can't get out of these systems. So when you think of something like Medicare or Medicaid or you think of something like a subsidized metro system or things like this, they're generally proposed to help poor people or people of less means are often proposed in these situations. And even things like Obamacare, public school systems, they're proposed to help people of, of lower means. Now, as a side to say, like I said, when I came up with this idea, I was a poor intern at the Cato Institute and I and it what trapped me in the metro and had to deal with the three hour wait as opposed to walking outside. And at that point Uber was just coming online. But what trapped me there was my poverty. And as an aside, we haven't mentioned this yet, but but one of the things that came came to me when I was coming up with this idea is that there is a great song by the Kingston Trio that some of you might know called MTA, which is a covering of an old campaign song about – from a Boston mayoral campaign where one of the proposals of, a, of one of the candidates was to raise the price of getting off the Metro five cents. And so one of the candidates who opposed this guy had this song written that – 
postulated a guy who couldn't afford the five cents to get off of the Boston Metro and so he's stuck on it for the rest of his life. I, I, I suggest looking it up. But but that guy who can't afford to pay five cents to get off the Metro is is the – is in, in the song, it's Charlie is stuck on the MTA and, and poor people are stuck on these things that are conceptualized usually for them in some way. Is stuck the right way to talk about it though because the – the impetus behind these things, behind say Medicare or public transportation, if we're if we're framing it around helping the poor, is that the poor are not being provided with a service right now, and or the services that are out there are too expensive for them to afford. So healthcare is too expensive, or transportation is too expensive. So what we're going to do is provide them with a cheaper alternative. And so now that cheaper alternative may not be great. Uh, Medicare is not great. The metro is not great. But to say that they're then stuck in it doesn't seem quite right because it's not like they had all these alternatives and then we shoved them into this one, but rather they couldn't get the better alternatives. They still can't get the better alternatives, but at least they now have a non-zero one they have access to. Well, it depends on where you're starting, where you're thinking about your starting point. First of all, when you talk about things like access to medical care and things like this when it came to pre-Medicare, pre-Medicaid, uh, there was systems for that to happen and there are ways that you could have proposed regulatory changes that would have made it better and easier for those – for a flourishing market to exist for poor people to have access to these things. Um, now, again, in terms of the metro, sometimes the point of it is to create a new system around – like to actually redesign the city when they do city planning and all these things and give them and give them access. Now, they maybe weren't getting into the middle of the city before. They were working on the outside of the city and that's one choice that they made and now they're giving them an option to get into the city. But again, the point is this doesn't always mean that the critique of some of these things means that they're bad. This is a deep way of understanding how the world is reorganized in such a way because the trapped element of it comes in on the later steps because the gut because it becomes the only option and when it becomes the only option for these poor people then I would say that they're trapped especially when that thing starts to run down um, because of the nature of government programs to to become worse and more expensive over time and then I think the right term is trapped and but the most important part of this is that it, it, it's eliminating these statrix things, whether it's Obamacare, Medicare, Medicaid, Metro, public schools uh, or any, anything else we can name. What they do is they eliminate other possibilities and the most, the most horrible part about the statrix and the reason I use this sort of matrix word is that when it looks like Medicare is the only thing around it, and it is the only thing around because it's crowded out of other, other possibilities. We think that the world before Medicare was just the world as it is now but without Medicare. But that's not the case. And the worst thing that we lose when the Statrix is in full operation is imagination. We lose the ability to imagine how things could alternately be or have entrepreneurs out there trying to make ways to get access for poor people to have medical care because you can't compete against the government. But that gets into the, the further steps. OK. So after we've come up with a concept of – how to improve the lives of a given set of Americans um, and then we move on to implementing it. Trevor Burrus Yes, and the most important thing about implementation is that it's done through taxation. Now, aside from whether or not taxation is theft or whatever, it's a coercive non-voluntary payment. And one thing we know about governments is that they basically can build anything, I mean with some democratic checks, but they can build anything with coercive non-voluntary payments. This is a basic – rule we use when we think about free markets, if it's a voluntary transaction that something exists is a demonstration at least initially that people want it. So this is true of even things like Nickelback. I mean the very existence of Nickelback or the New York Jets and your existence. Well, the continued existence. The continued existence, yes. At the initial, they can, can try to existence yes. and people don't want them and then they go away. But Nickelback has you know, made the same album for whatever 15 – Hundred years, however long they've been around, um, but I, since they're not a state-sponsored band, I presume that there are Nickelback fans out there. I presume that there are people who shop at Edible Arrangements. I've never shopped at Edible Arrangements. I have no idea who shops there, but it, because it exists, I presume it's done through it's done through voluntary transactions. Now, with the government using taxation, this is important for the for the step on on the statrix level. Is that again going back to transportation questions? 
you could put – so right now they're putting this high-speed rail line in California. And it's supposed to go from Los Angeles to San Francisco and it doesn't actually really go from Los Angeles. It doesn't really go to San Francisco. It's way outside Los Angeles to way outside San Francisco. But nevertheless, they put this thing in. And it doesn't matter that people may not want to pay the full price of what it would actually cost to have a heist because they're going to have to subsidize the ticket. They can put this in. They can just they can put a, if they wanted to put a high speed rail line from Minot, North Dakota to Pueblo, Colorado, they could that could exist. Even though no one act, actually wants to go from Minot, North Dakota to Pueblo, Colorado, they could put that in with taxation. But to put it on a more on a, on a different sense, imagine here in D.C. they put a metro line from here to say Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, no one really wants to commute from Lancaster, Pennsylvania to D.C. at the cost that it would actually – with an, a non-subsidized cost. But if they put that in there, they could do it with taxation and then you get steps – you would get steps – you get steps three through seven after that if you just created an artificial commuting community in Lancaster, Pennsylvania that people aren't paying the actual price of because taxation is being used to implement it. When you say they don't want it, do you mean they don't want it now or – they wouldn't want it in retrospect because you can say like – so a lot of say our major urban centers exist because some piece of infrastructure was there like say a port. You know, so we it's – people didn't say, hey, I want the city of Baltimore. They There was a port and then it grew up around it. So maybe you know, of course we don't want – there's not a lot of people clamoring for a transportation or would pay the full cost right now for a transportation system between this city and that city. But – Maybe that's because we as consumers have a lack of imagination and so you need a planner, a policy analyst, a congressman, a lobbyist to step in and say, I have a vision and if you can – you, the state, can coercively fund this thing, you're all going to thank me later when we have these major hubs and we've built up commerce and there's all this thriving vibrancy that wasn't there before. That's a really great question and again, like I said, the, the, the observation that something is a statrix piece um, is not a complete condemnation of it. It's a way of analyzing it. It could be possible for city planners to predict the next place people want to go but like they, they also wouldn't necessarily be predicting. They'd also be influencing that and if you listen to our episode with Randall O'Toole, uh, they usually don't do a very good job of predicting this stuff or they impose a vision on the city with you know 50-year city plans that um, end up being a perfect example of the state tricks if they actually try to implement it. I did once see – and I think I said this in the Randall O'Toole episode. I did once see in Denver the city plan that was written in 1952 for Denver in 2020, which is amazingly – an amazing conceit to think that you know, without even being able to predict the technology, the future, or like what people would want, or anything, you could actually plan a city for that that long in advance. Um, right. I just I think it's we need to be careful to not. We often say like markets. We hear people say like markets give you what you want, you know, and then government is giving you these things that you wouldn't want or don't want. But of course, you know, one of the one of the critiques of markets that you hear from our friends on the left is that it. It makes us want things that we don't really mm -hmm. want like consumerism is about this kind of false consumer consciousness um, when in fact that's a a benefit of markets is you know we didn't I had no idea I wanted this thing and someone came along and created it and told me I wanted it and it turned out, yeah, now that I know about it, I actually did. But if you had polled me like if we ran markets by having consumers check off or, or fill in the blanks on like which products would you like to see over the course of the next year? Our markets would look very different and much more impoverished than they do well, that's right really, now. That's a great and point. so we want to we want to be sure that we're not saying the government can't do a similar thing. Right? Yeah, that's a really great point. Um, and that would get to a point that that we'll talk about on my eighth step, or it's not totally a step of the statrix, but the circumvention point, which is what entrepreneurs are supposed to be doing. Like the value of entrepreneurs in a market situation where they have the ability to fail. It's the ability to fail that keeps markets from generally creating the statrix kind of situation aside from monopolies. I mean, we won't get into that. But like uh, the, the, that ability to fail, it's the inability to fail that turn, makes the government very different uh, in this way or at least 
easily fail. So yes, governments – any libertarian who says you know, governments can't provide things that are either good or people want is overselling the point. They absolutely can. The question is whether that they usually do, whether they can do in comparison. And also remember that one of the most uninteresting things that can ever be said about government is that they give you something that you like. This is a very important – I mean I was talking with a guy the other day about bike share, which has become a big thing here in D.C. And his main argument for why it, it's a good idea is that he really likes it. And I said, <laughs> just like, okay, so the government takes taxes, puts a bunch of bikes on the street and you like it. This is not a theory of government. This is a theory of stuff for you. So yes, if someone gets a comp commuter metro rail from Lancaster, they may like it, especially if they don't have to pay the full price, which they assuredly wouldn't. Um, the question is whether or not that's something government should be doing. So we come up with a concept, then we implement it with taxes. And then this is when we start seeing I think that the metaphor mm -hmm. come into being, which is when we start reorganizing around it. Yes, and that's and, and that's when you start building the state trick. So I already mentioned what would happen if you built a Lancaster commuting line. And again, you gotta have the deep critique. If we did put a commuter line from DC to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and it was subsidized, there'd become a commuter commuting a, a commuter community there. And then if fifty years later we say why are people – what we need to take that away and then someone says, if we take that away, then how are people going to get from Lancaster to DC? It's like, well, you created this problem and you reorganize the world around it by doing this. And so it clearly happens in transportation situations. It happens – the transportation hubs and large uh, physically immobile stations reorganize cities constantly. And in fact, Megan McCardle wrote a piece a while back about the DC streetcar, which is a huge boondoggle that people are now saying just scrap it, it's never going to work. It goes up and down this H Street corridor and it's overrun in cost and it's overrun in time. I'm not even sure. It is it is working now or do you know? Anyway. I don't know. I don't ever go to H Street because I don't go to bars. Yes. <laughs> um, and so it, it's so if you ever if you live in DC, it's interesting you say they so they they take a lane of traffic and my brother, I was just in Sydney, Australia, and he says they're doing this in Sydney too. You take a lane of traffic and you take it out by putting tracks in it, and so you make the traffic worse on the street to put this you know nice, fancy new thing in place back and forth. Uh, and that thing is now immobile, like it has to run that course and have these stops that are going to be those stops. Whereas the most efficient thing that you can run as a basic public transportation thing and it has less Statrix effects is a, just a city bus system because it doesn't have to destroy a lane of traffic. It's actually – you can move it to the people as opposed to having the people move to the transportation hub. And Megan McArdle said, well, maybe one of the reasons that politicians really like these large, expensive, immovable transportation projects is because it gives them a better opportunity for graft basically. Like if, if there is a stop of a large, physically immovable uh, transportation system, then every property value around that is going to go up and they can say that's never going to go away. All these businesses are going to be held by this where you say we might change a bus line and move it somewhere else. But that's – again, that's part of how the reorganization works. People move there. Uh, businesses move around those things and, and after that, pe the city – people forget what the city used to look like and they think that's what the city naturally looks like and that's where you have the reorganization. But of course, it's not just transportation. Um, it's a really good example of the state tricks. If you're American, this is uh, if you listen to Free Thoughts a lot, you probably know the answer to this question. But why do we get insurance through our jobs? Is this basic question? And and it's so normal here that you probably haven't thought how just non-normal that is. It may, it's, makes no sense that you would have insurance to your jobs. It wouldn't be something. So we get health insurance. We're all quite used yeah, to getting health all sorts insurance. of kinds of yeah. insurance without our jobs. Yeah. Like we don't get auto insurance or homeowners insurance. Yes, yeah, I meant yeah, I meant health insurance. So it makes little to no sense why that'd be the case. And and if you're you know a cynical enough libertarian or you've been doing this for a long enough time, you see something that like that that doesn't make sense, or you finally realize it doesn't make sense. You probably maybe had never thought that it doesn't make sense, which is again the state tricks part. Um, and then you say, well, what happened? And the answer to that question of why we get insurance for our jobs generally has to do with the tax break I mean, it was, it, that went into the tax code in the early 1950s after the post-war – in the post-war world, there were some wage and price – there were some wage ceilings um, for people coming back. So they said you're not allowed to give people say more than $10,000 – I can't remember what the exact ceiling was, but like more than $10,000 in take-home wages. Um, and so when you put a wage ceiling in, 
people who are worth more than $10,000 are going to get paid in a different way. So some companies started paying them with benefits, health benefits. And so they, those benefits were themselves not taxed and not part of that wage ceiling. And then in the early 50s, Congress put that into the tax code and they now – and that means that you, you can decline your health insurance through your job and take your taxed wages and then go buy health insurance on the market. But that's sort of a silly thing to do because the, the benefits themselves are not taxed according to the tax code. That's a small thumb on the scale 60 years ago. Um, but you run that that game forward. So first of all, everyone, every, the insurance companies reorganize around this tax plan. They reorganize their business plans around selling to large employers more than having a competitive individual buying market. So that's part of the reorganization. And then everyone starts falling into the statrix and they think that this is normal. And then we get to the quote unquote crisis of the uninsured when Obamacare was first being discussed in 2009, which is really just a crisis of the unemployed or the underemployed insofar as it was a crisis. And of course, the obvious answer to that was to look back in time and try and figure out where the reorganization took place. But that's not something that policymakers generally do. So they, they reified and doubled down the whole thing with this idiot law called Obamacare. But that's another type of reorganization. As you say this though, I'm – the question that comes to mind is any change in our environment is going to cause reorganization. Mm -hmm. So no matter what government does or what a market actor does or what individuals do, it's going to – change the environment and then the rest of us are going to adapt to that in some way and then that adaptation, especially if it's larger scale or longer term, is going to become sticky such that we could always say, look, yes, we could go back and say that you know this was the thing that caused it but um, that doesn't change the fact that then dumping that, that influence on the market will be often painful or require abrupt readaptation. So are you describing something that is unique to the way the state operates versus just the state is relatively big um, and, big and so big, big things have bigger yeah. effects. Um, but you know, so did the we uh, most of us have reorganized our way our lives in often positive but often negative ways <laughs> around the introduction of the smartphone. Um, and yes, is that, no, is are, the, are we existing in a smartphone so, statrix so, as well? So it is. It's it's again. Remember, step two is implementation. It is the unique ability of the state to do its reorganization in the way it can do it without voluntary transactions. You could do an analysis. I mean, if, if via entire voluntary transactions, someone put a shopping mall. Now, those usually involve some sorts of tax credits too. But just put a shopping mall, then yes, that also reorganizes stuff. But, but, but the preference here is for voluntary interaction and interaction that so – the preference of voluntary interaction, interaction that meets the needs of people as they're perceived at the time and then things that can go away easily if they fail. Okay, that's one of the biggest things that commends the market over government is its ability to fail effectively um, and then to deal with those problems quickly as opposed to having them persist. So, and the funny thing is, is that yes, the government is big, so it has big re reorganization effects. But the, when I, the story I told about insurance, health insurance, your jobs, that was a very small effect based in step two, the implementation through the tax code, just a little adjustment of that, of their ability to how much they're going to take from your wages or not can reorganize the world in a drastic way. So it, it still is that unique taxing ability that makes their reorganization different. But that's an excellent question. And so then they move on. We've, we've reorganized. Um, but that reorganization doesn't just change the way that we interact with this particular thing, but it changes the way we interact or can't interact with other things via crowding out. Yeah, step four is crowding out. So, um, so to the the story so far, they they come up with something to help generally poor people. They implement it with taxation. The re, they re, the world starts to reorganize around it slowly, and then after it's been more and more reorganized. Step four is a crowding out of other possibilities. Now, the best example of this is public schools. Um, but most things in the government, I mean, they're, especially if they are for helping poor people, they, they're subsidized in some way. Uh, many things, I mean, there's many things the government does, the kind of things we're talking about here. Public schools are a really good example, and this goes back to the point I made at the beginning. The most important thing about that you know should take away from what I'm saying here 
is the imagina imagination point because here we start to get the statrix because first the world looks differently and people forget why the world looks differently. But then other things go away and people think that there are no other options. And the thing that libertarians are really – I think the hardest thing that we have to fight against is a lack of imagination. And if you've ever had a conversation where you try to convince maybe a friend of yours that private schools can work and their first answer was, oh, yeah, because everyone can just go to those rich private school, Catholic schools like Groton in Massachusetts where FDR went. And you, your reaction is, has to be, are you that lacking in imagination that you don't understand that if public schools either went away or we voucherized it all or did many other things, tax credits, whatever, the world would look fundamentally different. There would – people – there are no schools that are competing like for low-income kids. There are no, there's no one creating those schools here, which is why books like James Tooley's A Beautiful Tree, which was published by the Cato Institute, is really valuable where he talks about how the poorest people in the world are educating their kids privately because you need examples. And when those examples go away, they the, the statrix infects the brain and you think that, oh, well, the world look, would look the same in the absence of the public school system. Is this lack of imagination because – Non-libertarian groups have quite a bit less of the demographic density of sci-fi nerds that libertarianism <laughs> does. It's funny because I gave a little talk on sci-fi in Australia at this conference I was speaking at and that's one point I brought up. I think one thing that sci-fi – one reason for the libertarian sci-fi is – some. I mean one of them is you, ha you think about other ways of doing things and, you, and you're better at not getting caught up that this is the only way of doing things. So yes, the crowding out is important um, and of course crowding out happens in healthcare. It happens, it just, it, it happens in, in transportation. Uh, the, the metro – no one in DC or really probably no one anywhere. Don't quote me on that. It's not my expertise but Randall O'Toole once told me I think that um, – the, the New York City metro comes the closest to breaking even, but every metro is subsidized to some degree. The DC metro, so if you're paying the full cost, it would be much more expensive than it is. Um, Although I believe I've heard the DC metro has the the consumer bears a larger chunk of its overall costs than is typical. I think that's true because they don't get as much money from the local governments. But so you're you're paying a subsidized rate now. Compete, competing against a subsidized rate at all on anything is very difficult for someone who wanted to start a voluntary organization to transport people around that doesn't enjoy the benefit of step two taxation. And so if you wanted to create a jitney cab company, which is sort of a little neighborhood taxi somewhere between a bus and a van that, that, that well, we can talk about those in a few steps too, um, you, have to, you have to charge full price to cover your, uh, your costs and then some profit. Um, and Competing against the government that doesn't do that means that those things don't exist. And this is the very slow and subtle way that people start to think that the statrix is real and the only possibility because they say, well, where are the private schools? And like that's the thing that we have to constantly show them. And the other thing about the crowding out and the imagination point, which I'll come back to a few more times, it's a very important point, is when we – they always can point to something like the existing public school system. Um, what we want is that thing to go away so that these statrix effects can, can can be eliminated and then for a thousand flowers to bloom of different types of schools out there. So, so what does your private school system look like? You say, well, like I don't know. I'm not an educator. Like I believe in people and I believe that people want to educate their kids and I believe that they will figure out many different ways that I can't even conceive of, of how to do that. And I'm sure it's probably better than a Prussian model of education system designed in 1890 that hasn't changed at all. So it's hard to point to what a private education system would look like as they get more and more eliminated. And when those things go away entirely, our job as advocates for liberty becomes become very difficult to even say, look at look at this schooling system in Nairobi, Kenya, or look at the schooling system over here. If the statrix takes over, people will lose the ability to imagine other possibilities almost entirely. And it's very it will be, make our job almost impossible. I think one of the pernicious effects also of the subsidizing that that props up the government systems, whether it's public schools or public transportation or Medicare, Medicaid is that it gives consumers so it doesn't just it doesn't just crowd out competitors in the sense that like they can't they can't make as much money um, they can't they can't compete on price but that it 
it anchors a certain price in the mind of the consumer as what this thing should cost that is a highly misleading. So mm -hmm. they say like, you know, these private schools are so ex they're just like education should not cost that much. Yes. Education should cost the the next to nothing I pay out of my pocket to send my daughter to a public school. And it should be like, getting cheaper and better. But, but what's what's hidden there is the actual cost that I'm paying. So it's not like private schools are actually more expensive than public schools because in many cases they're not. In fact, you know, you can we Cato, we've put out studies on the actual like how much per student are we paying for say this public school system? How much money is the school spending per student? And you get things like the I think the DC public schools cost roughly as much per year per student as the tuition you and I paid for the private law school mm -hmm. that we attended. It's about twenty seven thousand dollars a year, I think, for DC, which is which the is most. substantially more than yeah, private tuition. schools cost. The same with public transportation. Like we get to thinking that it ought to cost a buck twenty five to get across town and therefore when someone wants to charge eight dollars to get across town, we're like, no, well that's just that's outside of the reasonable range. Mm -hmm. But in fact we're paying that at least that amount in Actual costs or our copays on health insurance that we think these procedures ought to cost the ten dollar copay and we don't see the hidden costs. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And and again, if you have the ability to get out of the public school system, and this is again going back to the metro thing, me being poor as an intern, my story of the MTA song from the Kingston Trio with Charlie being stuck on the metro. But the people who are stuck in the public school system are poor people, and they don't have the they, they don't you know it's like. Just like Charlie didn't have five cents to get off the metro, they don't have, you know, even five hundred bucks uh, to get out of the public school system, which has now crowded out other possibilities. And of course, that's just one example. And because they're paid for via taxes, mm -hmm. they're subsidized via taxes. Getting out doesn't actually mean really getting out. It just means continuing to pay for while not using. Yes, exactly. So uh, this is when it gets very pernicious. Um, it gets mostly onto poor people. Okay. So then one of the interesting things that happens, which is the next step, is that we have so far we've been talking about the state. And we've been talking about the state does something, the state pays for something, um, the state then pushes other market participants out. But at some point when these programs or services or goods become entrenched enough, it kind of draws the market actors back in but in not a good way but in a, a collusive way. Yeah, and collusion is very subtle. We, you know, everyone sort of talks about money and politics and all these huge problems with, with collusion. It, it's, it's subtler than that because – Individual people can have a huge interest in continuation of a government program that maybe shouldn't exist or shouldn't have existed in the first place. So to return to my hypothetical metro line to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, like everyone who then purchased a house around there, uh, which is now worth a ton more money or so prob probably a significant more money because of that line, if they ever came in and said, let's remove this line, those people are going to be voting for not doing that if it's a voting initiative or they're going to, you know, Actualize their preferences in some other way, and those people, you know, they, you could be the biggest libertarian ever, and and still be like, I don't want to lose half the value of my house that I bought, expecting this metro stop to be here. And so, this is you know one of the stupidest things that Romney said when he was running in 2012 was this 47 percent concept. And a lot of people have pointed out that you know you talk about the direct payments to people in the form of. of Welfare checks, the kind of people that Mitt Romney was talking about and, and this is just so wrongheaded in terms of the kind of people who are actually sucking on the government teat. And so I use this example. One example I use is agricultural policy. If you know anything about U.S. agricultural policy, it was designed by evidently – I always say it was designed uh, – after a White House Christmas party on the back of a cocktail napkin in about 1935 because it's that crazy. I mean it's 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 absolutely insane. It's a cartel system uh, that's socialized and collectivized in a huge degree and this means that you have things like the Raisin Administrative Committee, which is something that I wrote a couple of briefs for in a Supreme Court case and the Supreme Court recently heard – said – struck down part of the Raisin Administrative Committee's powers. But let's go back. There is a Raisin Administrative Committee. I mean, this is not a Ayn Randian dystopic novel. This is a thing that exists. There's also a there's also a Spearman Oil Administrative Committee. There's all these other things, but the Raisin Administrative Committee itself was 
brought into being in 1949. And they have the power to control the price of raisins by taking raisins from farmers. Now, at the Supreme Court, the farmer who was challenging it had many briefs on his side. And there was only one brief on the side of the Raisin Administrative Committee. Would you like to guess who wrote that brief? Raisin industry. Yeah, Sun-Made Raisins, which controls 23 seats, I think, on the 47-person Raisin Administrative Committee. Now, Sun-Made doesn't need the government to, pro to, to protect itself. It, this is a really good example of how much businesses fear competition or just anything that you put in place, they're going to be like, well, we need to continue this thing to exist. The Raisin Administrative Committee is something that has to continue to exist because it has existed and it must continue to exist. So this is another type of collusion. If you think about it, you could do almost anything. You could – if you passed a law that said every blue thing had to be launched 25 feet in the air before it's sold, it would probably be like a new deal make work law and then they're launching blue things in the air. They're launching blue cars up in the air and all this stuff and, and then – and then selling them and then 40 years later, someone says, why are we launching blue cars in the air? And they're going to go, my daddy launched blue cars in the air. This industry has been launching blue, blue things in the air for – Plus there's a lot of for my daddy. employed yeah. in the launch and if it was And if it was, un if it was unionized, you know, I mean, forget about it. Like it was like, you know, that's why the Statrix comes in and the collusion is very subtle. And again, you take industries like the kind, like alcohol is a really good example too. So we have a three-tiered monopoly system in alcohol distribution in the United States because of the hangover from prohibition. And again, this is the reason why. So you, you're, most of your big beer and alcohol people kind of support this because it's what they've all, always known. And so there's wholesalers and retailers, producers and wholesalers and retailers. And so this is why you have a patchwork like I can't get Odell's just mailed to my house um, because – and there's a collusion going on there between the liquor industry and this existing stupid system, which is not as stupid as the blue launching system, but it's not much stupider than that. I mean, it's, not, it's not much better than that. And it's definitely not much better than the Raisin Administrative Committee. Um, so you have this system with alcohol and alcohol is a really good example because that's a statrix thing on a local level, on a national level. But again, you have to look at this thing like I had said about – when you see something weird like why is insurance through my job or you see something like why can I not purchase beer from the brewery in Colorado that I really like and have it mailed to my house in Virginia? Like why is that not a thing? And we've become very accustomed to, well, of course you can't do that. No, I mean that's a thing. That's the complaint. Of, of course, of course. Like it should be a thing that you can do and the reason it isn't a thing is because of this three-tier monopoly. And, and we can get to it in step – sort of step eight. But like you think about it, there are people trying to drop burritos from the sky via drones that you call to your place via the phone, uh, burrito drones. It's, it's a real thing. The FAA, of course, made that a problem. But there are people trying to come up with this business and I cannot order a beer to my house in Virginia from the brewery in Colorado. So again, Again, that kind of collusion, it's very subtle. It happens on the property level. It happens for insurance companies and the healthcare level. Pretty much almost anything you can imagine uh, that the government does, whether it's a tax break or a property program, creates some sort of people who prefer it um, and want to keep it in place no matter how silly it is. So your next step, all of these steps where I have this outline of your talk that you gave me in front of me and all of the steps have sub points. And examples listed, except for this next step, which is inadequacy. Which is, was that intentional? I mean, it just sort of speaks for itself. Like, uh, but again, you know, remember uh, the my story at the Metro. Um, they put this thing in for me. It's implemented the taxation. They reorganize the world around it. They crowd out other alternatives. They collude to make sure it never goes away. In the Metro system, you have the Metro operators and the union and everything. And then after you're stuck in it because there aren't any competitive pressures, and because it's the government, and because steps one through five, that's one of the reasons. There also are any competitive pressures. They fail to run it adequately, and then the joke is really on you, like especially Mr. Poor Person. And obviously, the public schools are probably the best example of this in terms of what's doing the most damage to our society. But, but you can take anything from healthcare. You can almost name any one of them because the, the tendency of government programs is to become worse over time and more expensive. And so, and it's very, very, very not funny. I mean, you can watch like. Veep or something like this, some com comedic show where we make fun of government inadequacy. But it's incredibly not funny, especially to the poorest people who need to – who are trying to use something that they put into place that is just simply not doing the job. So we've come up with a plan to fix things. We've implemented with taxes. We've reorganized our lives in large part or in, at least in small part around it. We've crowded out alternatives. Um, Outside people have begun to collude with this thing. 
then it either didn't work very well to begin with or at least after a while it certainly isn't working very well. And so then our final step as administers of the Statrix <laughs> um, is to keep it all going by prohibiting anyone from – Escaping self, self or help, offering yeah. methods to escape. Yes, exactly. And I mean, it can be as simple as um, people who are fighting against voucher programs or private school programs, different things that are trying to emerge up, tax credit programs. There are people out there fighting against that because they want to keep these people in these schools. I mean, they have their own theory that keeping people in these schools was the only way to make the schools better and things like that. But like they're, they are trying to prohibit getting out of the system. Um, you have people the fight against Uber. Uh, and again, this is the most important thing. Uber, which we'll get to in the in the um, in the next uh, step or the the final sort of hope that I have. It's not really part of the Statrix, but Uber is a really good example of the Statrix sort of things that can help destroy it. Because before Uber, most people did not know there was a taxi cab cartel, or they kind of knew if they kind of knew that, but they probably didn't. And Uber is a really good example of this thing that is so simple. It so should have existed. The taxi, taxi should have been the one to do it, to have been the first movers on it. But of course they weren't because they had no incentive. This is actually – it's an interesting one to, as a highlight of your lack of imagination that, that ends up playing into this because I noticed in, in some of the things that I've been reading recently. Um, so I've been listening to a couple of – I bounced between – reading chiefly crime fiction and reading sci-fi and I am on a sci-fi kick and so I recently have been, I've been listening to a couple of sci-fi novels and I've also been rereading Warren Ellis's great comic series Transmetropolitan um, and I noticed something that, has, that shows up a fair amount which is these sci-fi authors make incredibly out there predictions about what the future will look like um, and we have – all sorts of strange technologies and all sorts of disruptive technologies in the Silicon Valley speak. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things that seems to remain constant, A, is the war on drugs. There's always like the plots of these always end up having, you know, these there's some newfangled drug with a really like cringeworthy name um, that we have to stop, you know, <laughs> ro the Robocop movies <laughs> yeah, yeah, or whatever, exactly, you know. Yeah. Um, that they we seem to not be able to imagine that the war on drugs will probably not be around in a few hundred years. Um, but the other one is hailing a yellow taxi yes, cab. Uh, yes. Like no matter how advanced <laughs> society is, there still are the scenes where they run after a cab or talk about a cab or have to look for the suspect got into a cab and we have to Precisely. And this is even these sci fi authors you can imagine you, you know, ships battling in, in interstellar combat uh, can't you know n never seem to be like Uber, wow, this is a crazy idea. And I remember the first time I got into an Uber. Well it, what they did is they came in and they gave a bunch of free rides to people in D.C. as part of the disruptiveness and so we can talk about that a little bit more in a sec. But at first I said, OK, so a guy's going to pick me up in a car, like his car. I was like, so like, like if, what's the catch? I mean, is he going to like sell me Amway on the way or like tell me about you know uh, all these possibilities for timeshares in Mexico or something? I mean it was – and then I get in this car. He's like pulls right up and like he like drops me off and he's – and I just – my first – and I get out. I'm like, that was unbelievable. And that is the Statrix. I mean that right there was me getting a little bit of a red pill of being like these are the possibilities you could have. But nevertheless, as you're talking about with step seven here, people are trying to prohibit these things most recently in Austin, which has reverted to you know, 1990s situ situation or early 2000s situation without any good form of transportation when they prohibit Uber. And it, 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 it's, it becomes a real problem. Now, you can do it. Many countries prohibit you know, private some some countries prohibit privately paying for medical costs. Um, not not many do that. Canada uh, had a Supreme Court ruling that made that. Uh, Canada Quebec had a, Supreme, a ruling that made it unconstitutional to prohibit getting healthcare outside the system. But pe there, there there are people out there who are so devoted to the state trick system they believe in that they think that the as I said like the public schools that they need to get everyone inside of it. Um, in order to approve it as opposed to trying to think outside the box and be like, look, Uber is an amazing thing. Airbnb is an amazing thing. Prohibiting these things is silly. Jitney cabs have been prohibited in New York. Uh, the little bus things I was talking about, 
licensing is a prohibition scheme which works within the state where people are getting prohibited from just paying the agreed upon price for a person to cut their hair without a license. These are ways that they try to prop up the state tricks. And in prohibition, it works with the crowding out and everything where if they do fully prohibit something, then you get this, the state tricks effect, effect again, which is people forget that there is another way of doing things. And this is the true harm of the state tricks is that you forget that there is another way of doing things. So the best solution to all of this would be to not get started on it in the first place. Be aware uh, that that I mean I said I'm not going to condemn every government program uh, just across the board. Be aware that things that that seem like a small thing like a tax break for insurance can create a state tricks that creates bigger problems than not having done it in the first place. But once it's here and it's here in multiple overlapping ways can we circumvent it? Yeah, and that's and that is the last sort of step of of my talk, which is my real hope for the best case for liberty that can be made right now, which is not coming out of Cato or libertarianism.org or this podcast. We have, you know, so many people listen to us, we can only have so many people read our papers or things like this. For me, but all of you can tell your friends. But yes, all of you can tell your friends, but and we encourage you to do so. But the Entrepreneurship of what are so-called disruptive technologies right now is to me the most hopeful thing for living in a freer world in the future. And I used Uber as a small example, but we could write a thousand papers on how there's a taxicab cartel, but it would never be as effective as a simple person who uses Uber realizes how much better it is than a taxi cab, taxi cartel, and then you know writes their congressman or tweets or fights for it or just set, or just becomes a person who understands there's a better way of doing things than the same old government inadequate mediocre way. And so Uber is one of these. Bitcoin is another one. I mean, it, you know, we we talked with George Selgin. It's been a couple a year and a half ago or something like that, but uh, you know, a, a really good example of a state tricks thing is a lot of people don't know that the U.S. government didn't print money until the Civil War, really, and so there was private money uh, issued by banks, issued by states in different ways for a very long time, and we simply can't imagine how that could work. And a big, if you go back and listen to our episode with George, I'm, I'm trying to ask him, like, how does this even work? And that's an example because I've been living in the state tricks and I forgot how these things can work. But we have these disruptive technologies coming in and they're starting to show people the seams of the state tricks. And they're starting to show people that there's a way of doing things. And they're incredibly important. These are very important to the case for liberty because they're doing – things through entrepreneurship to solve problems that used to be claimed to be only solved by the state. So why did we lack li license taxi cabs in the first place? Aside from pure graft and pure public choice, we thought that people needed to be assured that they have a safe ride. Well, that's one way of trying to ensure people have a safe ride. Another way of doing it is with a more market-oriented solution where you have a rating system, a reputation system. You have very quick information that moves back and forth so you can get people off of that they, if they do – if they have a problem. That's one – that's another way of doing it and that's proving to be better and more effective in, on, in an entrepreneurial solution. All these things that we had for rating your dock and all these things that could come up for Airbnb in the way that they actually address the problems uh, that people think we needed a hotel licensing board for, we needed you know guarantees of cleanliness and things like this. Airbnb can do it without any of this stuff and with a robust rating system and a robust feedback system and a, an ability to fail very quickly and to fix the problem immediately. These things are incredibly important and they're starting to disrupt the world and I hope they can continue to disrupt the world because most things have an entrepreneurial solution to them in some way. And the one that I want to point you to, uh, if you want to get an idea of the state tricks, especially if you're American, is to go to a website called newcare.net, N-E-U-C-A-R-E.net, and it's a website of a concierge medicine doctor. Concierge medicine is a system where you don't take Medicare, Medicaid, or private insurance, and by not doing that, you avoid all the red tape that the government puts on those. You run a cash transaction business as a doctor or a credit transaction. You can go on installment plans, things like this. If you look at that website, you'll see things like you pay $30 a month for 29 and under and you get 
unlimited emails to your doctor. You get a yearly flu vaccination. You get uh, certain wellness checkups that are free for all that stuff. There's a whole list of stuff that you get. And, there, and then there's a, pri there's a family plan and then there's a price list for how much an x-ray costs or how much an MRI costs and everything that's included. And if you're looking, you're looking at that and you say, OK, this is a price list in medicine. That's crazy. Um, 24 or 7 access email to my doctor. I mean, that's nuts. I mean, that doesn't, that, that, that's like sci fi. Like, that is a sci fi level of bizarreness for American medicine. But you can see that there. And you, and, and if you look, if you look at that, you see, you, you have two reactions. One of them should be, this is amazing. I've never seen anything like this. And your second reaction should be, who screwed up the world so bad that I have never seen anything like this? And if you if you understand that, then you understand the statrix because it's your fascination by having never seen this before that the statrix created, and then the circumvention that this guy, uh, the the guy who runs these, these concierge, and there's a few other ones too. The circumvention creates a situation where we can see other possibilities. But the thing to be truly terrified of is if that even becomes prohibited. And I guarantee there are people who want to prohibit even concierge medicine because of whatever sort of collectivist reason they have. If that goes away and I can't even point you to go to this website and see that there are other possibilities, uh, then people will lack the imagination. More and more people will not even have an idea of how government, how doctors could even have price lists or they will just say, well, of course your doctor can't be responsive for email because they think that's normal and then that again will put us back in the statrix. So, the imagination those things can create, they need to be preserved and we need to create more of them through more entrepreneurship and more disruptive technology so we can live in a freer and a better world. Thank you for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.